right, welcome back everyone again. I feel like I've been up here a couple of times and haven't formally introduced myself. But uh, once again, my name is Brian McClendon. I am the Managing Director for PLACE with the William Julius Wilson Institute in the Harlem Children's Zone. And I am so excited to be here. I had an opportunity last night to meet with some folks from around the country that, that I've been uh, working with over the course of the last couple of years. And it's so exciting that we're finally all here together. So um, this is wonderful and I'm honored. All right, now that we've heard about what's happening in the field and some of the challenges that pro programs are facing, we want to focus and highlight some of the programs and what they're doing, right, in terms of best practices, their approaches, and also some solutions that they have within their cradle to career work. So, with great pleasure, I'd like to reintroduce the moderator, Dr. Russell Booker, Executive Director of the Spartanburg Academy Movement, Academic Movement. Um, for those who don't know, following his retirement, as superintendent of the Spartanburg County School District 7, Russell Booker was named executive director of the Spartanburg Academic Movement, also known as SAM. SAM is committed to ensuring Spartanburg's youth reach academic and life success by convening partners, aligning resources, and driving equity. Russell is deeply involved in the community and serves on several local, state, and national boards. He has garnered numerous awards over his career, and in June 2020, received the Order of the Palmetto, South Carolina's highest civilian honor for extraordinary lifetime service. Dr. Booker also holds a bachelor's degree in education from Wingate University and a PhD from the University of South Carolina in Columbia. So please give him a round of applause. All right. I, I didn't know we were going to do all of that. So. Well, good morning again. Uh, it's so much better to be sitting on this side <laughs> of, of the stage. Uh, and at the same time, I am so intimidated because we have four exceptional national leaders before us this morning and, and a lot to cover uh, in the next 40, 45 minutes or so. Um, what we'd like to do, of course, as Brian just mentioned, this is all about the work that's taking place and how can we come up with solutions and support many of your place-based cradle-to-career strategies. So what we're going to do, because we don't have bios, I would like for our panelists to briefly tell you who they are uh, and a little bit about their organization before we get into our conversation. So, so now that I'm going to start with you. Thank you, uh, Russell. It's lovely to be here, and thank you to the Wilson Institute for the opportunity to join all of you. I just want to start by saying being here today feels like coming home, uh, being with and in community um, with folks who are focused on community and focused on place. I just really appreciate it. So excited for the rest of this conference and for this conversation today. Uh, my name is Sonali Nijawin. I serve as the director for um, AmeriCorps State and National, which is one of four programs um, within AmeriCorps, the agency. Uh, and uh, I actually started my journey as an AmeriCorps member, um, having served in my home uh, town of Chicago a little over 16 years ago with a program called City Year. So some of you may be familiar with those red jackets, or if you're from California, those yellow jackets. Um, my year of service with City Year changed my life. Uh, it, opened, uh, it opened my eyes up to the city that I called home and the incredible people that um, lived in that city that I didn't know about and the communities that I didn't know about. So I was very grateful for the opportunity to serve. Um, and it inspired me to continue on a journey of public service. Um, I went on to launch City Year's 22nd site in Sacramento, California, uh, and then went on to just recently before um, joining the administration as uh, the director of AmeriCorps went on to, uh, or served as the executive director for the Stockton Service Corps, where I worked um, with then Mayor Michael Tubbs and then Superintendent Dr. John Daisy uh, to launch a place-based AmeriCorps initiative uh, in Stockton that was focused on cradle to career, that was focused on ensuring that young people um, were able to uh, read at third grade and were successful in math and had mentors and coaches uh, and all the supports that they needed. Um, so again, thank you for the opportunity to join. I do just, before I share a little bit about AmeriCorps, I do just want to see, I heard there's a, uh, that Brian is an AmeriCorps alum, Peacemaker of the Year, 1999. Are there any other <laughs> AmeriCorps alums in the house? How about Vista? Vista oh yes, Vista's an uh, Vista AmeriCorps and Vista. program. Alums and Vista, stand up, stand yeah. up, stand up, stand up. Alums and Vista. 
Yes, thank you. Me too, me too. Yep, that's awesome. Um, so great to see that. What about, just curious, AmeriCorps grantees? Any Amer anyone on the receiving end of AmeriCorps funds? Oh, we've got some. We've got some folks, and these folks are. Who are, wants to be on that end? Yes, that's right. That's right. We want. We want you to be on the receiving end of those funds. And to those of you who have been on the receiving ends of our funds, we apologize for the paperwork. But there, we know there's a lot. Um, but we we appreciate the opportunity to to be able to support the work you all are doing. Um, so for those of you who may be new to AmeriCorps or are looking to learn more, uh, AmeriCorps serves is the federal agency for service and volunteerism. Uh, we have over 250,000 AmeriCorps members and senior volunteers serving in over 40,000 communities across the country. Our members serve in large cities, they serve in small cities, they serve in rural communities, they serve everywhere and anywhere where they are needed. Um, we provide opportunities for people of all ages and backgrounds to give their time and talent to strengthen communities. And, um, you know, I think why I'm so excited to be here today is that AmeriCorps is fundamentally a place oriented program. It is about place and it's about partnership. Our members and volunteers partner with thousands of organizations like your own um, to, to determine what it is that they're going to do and how they are going to serve um, individuals who need additional support. So uh, this conversation is going to be really great. Again, it just feels like coming home. Having done this work prior to joining the administration, I feel like this is where I want to be. So thank you for, for having me. And congratulations on your appointment All by right. the administration to that. So I'm going to hop down to Barbara. Barbara, I'm throwing y'all off a little bit. So <laughs> if you would like to tell a little bit more about you, your organization, and, and what you're doing there. Certainly. Thank you. And I also feel like I'm with family here. I'm um, Barbara Squires. I'm the Director of Leadership Development at the Annie E. Casey Foundation in Baltimore. Um, I, my background actually is in public health. I ran the maternal and child health work at the Baltimore City Health Department for a very long time. Um, and, and really my entire work career until coming to Casey was in Baltimore. So I really have this affinity to working in place. Um, at the Casey Foundation now, I've been at Casey for about 15 years and um, for those of you who listen to NPR that may be the way you know the Casey Foundation <laughs> is through the tagline there. But um, the Casey Foundation is a national foundation that is focused on improving outcomes in a measurable way for children, families, and communities in this country. And the leadership work that we do that, that I'm in charge of is really highly aligned with the mission of the foundation. It is what we call results count leadership. And it's very specific to building the capacity of leaders to achieve measurable, improved, equitable outcomes for kids, families, and communities. And that's our niche of the leadership development world. It's in some ways, we're a one-trick pony. That is what we do. But I'm super thrilled as I came into the room and bumped into a number of folks who, um, who themselves are um, doing results count leadership. So in some ways, I think they're better spokespeople for, for the work that um, Casey has been trying to do than I am. But I'm delighted to be here and look forward to talking with you. And for those of us who are part of the Strive Together Network, so Lisa Hamilton, our president and CEO of the Annie E. Casey Foundation, is one of our Strive Together board members and, and is really supportive of, of this work. So Thank glad you're here. You. Dr. Ferguson. Hi, um, I actually grew up planning to do place-based work. And I was about eight years old, I asked somebody, what do you do as a job for a grown-up to make things better for people? And I was kind of looking around the neighborhood, and whoever answered my question said city planning. <laughs> so I grew up planning to be a city planner, found my way into economics, got a PhD in economics from MIT, because I thought that was where you go to figure out how to go back home and fix the neighborhood. Uh, PhD in economics at MIT has got nothing to do with the neighborhood. <laughs> uh, Got myself hired at the Kennedy School at Harvard in 1983, started teaching state and local economic development, making it up at the time because there wasn't a lot of curriculum. There's more now. Um, 
By 1999, published a book called Urban Problems and Community Development, Brookings Press, that collect, pulled together what I had figured out about what I needed to know. But meanwhile, around 1990, noticed and uh, learned around the same time a lot of other economists that standardized reading and math scores predicted most of the black-white early earnings gap. And most of the Hispanic white early earnings gap is about reading and math skills. You've got to give people something to sell when they go out to get a job. And so I uh, started doing K-12 work, um, gradually migrated from economic development to education work, started a company called Tripod Education Partners that provides survey research services to school systems around the country. Um, flash forward 2008, 2009, noticing the national data in the early child longitudinal survey that the cognitive skill gaps are there by the time kids are two years old. They're stark by the time kids are two years old. And a secret that I don't tell many audiences is that the gaps, the racial gaps are largest when your children, the children are the most educated. So this is not just about helping poor folks, okay? Wow. And the differences in parenting practices are not just among poor folks. They're also among the more well-to-do among, they're among our children. And so we started, uh, convened a conference in 2011, convened an expert advisory committee to help boil down the literature to what we call the five basic principles, which is what I'll talk about uh, here today. And we're trying to... I'll talk, I'll say more later about what we're doing with that. That's great, and Dr. Young already teed you up by talking about the basics uh, during his comments earlier this morning. So, Dr. Revel, if you'll wrap us up with the introduction. Sure, um, it's not often I get <clears throat> the opportunity to stand up as a VISTA volunteer, so um, my journey in this work began in 1972 in the housing projects in Somerville, Massachusetts, where I started as a youth worker, street worker at the time. Um, and then move forward in, in a whole variety of roles in education, most notably in doing place-based work in Worcester, Massachusetts and central Massachusetts, second largest city in New England, where we organized um, all kinds of communities to come together and support the education systems of the city and the surrounding area. From there, I went on to do policy work in education, working with the business community in Massachusetts to bring about uh, one of the nation's most successful education reform acts in 1993. Uh, in, in Massachusetts, uh, I joined the Board of Education, State Board of Education then, um, pursued a variety of roles in education after that, um, became involved with Deval Patrick, Deval Patrick appointed me chair of the State Board of Ed and then eventually Secretary of Education in Massachusetts and I served in those two roles for about six years time. Um, all along the way beginning in 1997 I, had, I was a a uh, person of practice, a lecturer of practice, and finally a professor of practice at the Harvard Graduate School of Education where I taught courses on leadership policy and, and uh, now collaboration. Um, after my stint in government service, I came back to Harvard, really proud of what we've achieved in education in Massachusetts and our number one standing in the country, but I told everybody it ought to be a short celebration because the achievement gaps were deep and profound and lasting and uh, that really we needed to revisit our conception of the problem. It wasn't just about school optimization, it's about taking into account the entire ecosystem in which children live and the, in, the profound inequities that prevail in that ecosystem. And until we do a better job as a society of preparing children to come to school genuinely ready to learn, that schools by themselves, however much we optimize them, cannot possibly be successful in, in getting to all means all. So we created an institute there called the Education Redesign Lab. A number of my colleagues are here today. Um, uh, Rob Watson, who you met earlier, was uh, one of those colleagues. Uh, we pursue really three things right now at the moment. Our three priorities are uh, children's cabinets and working with communities like Oakland, like Poughkeepsie, like Louisville, and others represented here uh, in building children's cabinets and bringing people together to, to serve children, chaired usually by the mayor and and uh, with the superintendent participating. We're working on success planning and navigators for children, um, which is another how strategy I'll be happy to talk about later. And we're also interested in working with a number of the organizations in this room and creating a fellowship program to create a pipeline of folks who are prepared to do this collaborative place-based work in building cradle to career systems in their, in their respective communities. So I'm looking so forward to hearing more detail about the specifics of that work and later on how you all can possibly engage with them. Ron, I want to start with you. Um, I'm in Spartanburg. We have imp implemented what's called the Palmetto Basics. And we talk about the basics all the time. 
Uh, I called our executive director when I saw you were on this panel. I said, is it the same organization? And she was like, oh yeah, we love Dr. Ferguson. And, um, but the thing that really struck me, she said, she's been in this for 30 years and the basics has probably been the most impactful thing that we've done. And then she wanted to tell me all about it. So I've had that luxury, but can you spend some time talking to um, the team here today in more detail about the basics and what you all are doing? Okay, <clears throat> great, thanks. The, um, <clears throat> I mentioned that we boiled the, the research down to five principles. We call the basics principles. Everything we do is anchored on these five principles. And the only non-negotiable in what we do is you can't change the wording of the five principles. Otherwise, we've got a whole suite of materials and guides to, that you kind of pour down like water around the rocks in your jar to fit your circumstances, right? But the, the, the principles are the anchor. And the anchor principle is maximize love, manage stress. Okay, that's the first of the five principles. Maximize love, manage stress. The second is talk, sing, and point. Third is count, group, and compare. The fourth is explore through movement and play. And the fifth is read and discuss stories. Those are the five principles. And the idea is to make those principles a lifestyle across entire communities. Okay. The idea was we wanted to go to scale with that. We put together, we have our organizations, The Basics Inc. We put together an infrastructure of technology a templates for local implementation, learning modules, uh, an evaluation system. So it's a plug-in, and it's very seldom freestanding, so it's a plug-in to whatever you've already got in place, and it crosswalks with whatever you're already doing. And so what I want to just quickly read through, this is actually the script for one of the modules in our learning management system that we're putting together, but it's a, like a three-minute script on what the basic strategy is. Um, so the basic strategy is to create basics communities. In a basics community, parents encounter the basic principles, principles before a child is born. Prenatal care providers and others remind prospective parents that adopting the principles as a lifestyle can help put the child on track, beginning at birth, to become a joyful and secure child, well prepared for kindergarten, and primed to achieve their full potential. In a basics community, there is socio-ecological saturation. That means that medical offices, workplaces, libraries, faith-based organizations, and other settings in the social ecology integrate information, social reinforcement, and nudges or reminders about the basics into their institutional lifestyles. Information, social re reinforcement, and nudges and reminders are the three gears of the basics experience. The first gear, information, comes in multiple forms. There are videos and tips in an online toolkit for parents, and workshop and activity guides for use in frontline organizations to convey the science behind the basics principles and simple everyday ways to apply that science in caring for children. The most, in, the most dependable form of delivering the second gear, which is nudges or reminders, is basics insights text messaging. Parents, grandparents, and other caregivers receive five years of twice weekly science-based facts and brain building activity ideas matched to the child's age and delivered to their phones starting at the child's birth or afterward and continuing through the fifth birthday. Over 70% of the people who respond to surveys that are embedded among the messages report that they discuss what they learn with other people, which brings us to the third gear, social reinforcement, which leverages the first two and amplifies their impact. Trusted messengers and local organization, organizations, in addition to friends and family members, provide support and encouragement. They may host events or workshops, direct parents to additional resources, or converse about the basics principles or basics insights messages or related topics. In a basics community, multiple forms of systemic change deliver energy and resources from outside the early childhood sector. In education, school systems don't wait for children to reach preschool. They promote, they promote the basics principles as a fun, simple, and powerful school readiness strategy to implement at home starting at birth. In healthcare, the basics approach becomes part of a prevention strategy for adverse childhood experiences and fosters innovation in how healthcare organizations are connected into their communities. And family services, promoting the basics lifestyle is part of a child abuse prevention strategy to humanize the Department of Child and Family Services and reduce the number of children removed from their families and placed in foster care. Becoming a basics community is not quick or easy. It requires a dedicated staff and a local backbone organization and a coalition of local allies. But the bottom line is that it is possible. 
and more than 70 communities in the basics learning network across 21 U.S. states and four nations are committed to pursuing it. In a basics community, we aspire to high levels of kindergarten readiness and broadly inclusive thriving beginning from birth, things that none of us can achieve alone, but that all of us can achieve together. And that's the basic strategy. And I hope, if time permits, we can spend a little bit of time closing talking about how communities can inquire about becoming yep. a part of this work. Barbara, we spent a little bit of time on the last panel talking about data. Uh, Alan, uh, of course, shared really the importance of data. As we think about your work and um, the many place-based partnerships who are here today, we are looking at population level data, and we're concerned about those outcomes, whether it is kindergarten readiness, uh, third grade reading proficiency, post-secondary educational attainment, um, housing, crime, I mean, there's just a plethora of different data points. The question that we wanted to pose to you was, how do you backwards plan from a population level outcome? How do you, how do you backwards plan as we're looking at this data? Sure, thank you for the question. Um, so in the results count world, which again is um, kind of the leadership approach that we um, deliver to social sector leaders, um, the idea is to get a group of leaders um, aligned toward a North Star, so a population level result, whether it's school readiness or um, all babies born healthy or third grade reading. Um, and then to, as a group, figure out, well, what would be our way of knowing that we're making um, progress toward that North Star. And that's in the setting of indicators. And that's where figuring out the data that you wanna use comes into play. Um, and then from there, the next step kind of backwards from that is um, doing the factor analysis. I think some people may call it, um, um, uh, uh, you know, sort of figuring out what, what actually is the story behind the curve mm -hmm. that contributes to the data looking the way it is. Um, and then from there, figuring out what are the most impactful strategies that folks can put into place together um, that if done in alignment with urgency, with attention to accountability, can really um, make a contribution to that population level result. So it's a pretty prescribed um, discipline approach to doing it. Um, I'm gonna anticipate your next question is like, what? Yeah, so it what? takes discipline. So <laughs> like, the anticipated what are, question is, is, where do we get stuck in that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so lots of places. Um, and and it, you know, it's, it, it's a methodology, it's a disciplined method, methodology. Um, but it's highly adaptive. I mean, it's not just cookie cutter, it's not just following this process, and, and leaders get stuck all the time. One place I think where leaders do get stuck um, is, you know, as much as folks, leaders like yourself, like me, say we don't wanna work in silos, there's a lot of comfort in working in your silo, right? There's, you know, you know what you're doing, you don't have to coordinate with partners, you don't have to give up anything, you sort of stay in your lane. Um, and that's a place where folks get stuck, is being willing to step out of being in your silo and really working in collaboration with others, not sort of at the margins, but really in, in a deep, deep way. Um, I think another place where folks get stuck is at the step of doing factor analysis. Um, it's, it's really easy to go from having named your North Star, like, yeah, we, we want all kids to graduate from high school, we want all babies born healthy, and then immediately go to strategy without uh -huh. doing the hard step of unpacking the data and, and trying to understand what it says. Um, and I think another place where leaders get stuck is if they go the route of doing factor analysis is that they often will do it in a rigged kind of way so that it actually justifies the strategies that you already have in place. Um, and so I think all along this continuum of like even setting your North Star, figuring out what your indicator data should be, doing the factor analysis, doing strategy development, and then setting performance measures so you know if you're making progress along the way, 
I mean, there are lots of places along the way where folks get stuck, but those three, I think, come to mind as being real challenges that leaders have to um, get around and, and make the hard decision that you're gonna do it with others in this deep collaborative way and not just work at the margins. Well said, thank you for that. So now that I've got about four questions that I wanna get to, I'll probably just get to two of them That's with fine. you. But, but the one I wanna deal with, all of us are dealing with issues around talent today. And you know, there's a shortage uh, in our public schools with teachers that we were talking about this morning, but I, I think even in the business sector, as we think about AmeriCorps, uh, this wonderful national program, you serve diverse communities across this country. Uh, how do you maintain consistent, high quality programming and, and recruitment uh, to serve these communities? And are you facing some of these same challenges right now? Yes, as far as facing these challenges. I mean, the r recruitment is really hard. Uh, and it is hard for us within AmeriCorps because it's a, it's a service program, right? And our AmeriCorps members receive a stipend. And we'd like to make sure that our AmeriCorps pro programs and our AmeriCorps members have a dignified service experience. And so uh, currently our leadership team is looking to find ways to increase that stipend for members because it's like candidly, it's not livable right now and that's not how it should be. And so we wanna get to a place where uh, to serve your community is a dignified uh, role and that anyone who wants to serve in their community can serve in their community. And it's not just for those who um, who have uh, privilege or folks who uh, have someone who uh, provides an additional amount of resource to cover the cost of housing, because that is really expensive. So recruitment is hard. We are definitely struggling. Um, but I think what uh, w the, the magic of AmeriCorps, in my opinion, there's a lot of magic to it, but um, we, are, we are focused on evidence-based evidence-informed, evidence-proven programs, right? So when I was in Stockton and we were talking about how are we gonna do this, how are we gonna make sure we're having an impact, I always came to the table with a lot of uh, confidence because I got to say we're coming with evidence to support the work we're doing. So the work of our members isn't just nice to have, it's needed because it's having a, there is, there is, there's impact that's happening in your school or in your classroom. So a young person who's serving as a tutor to a, a second grader to help accelerate their literacy rate is actually showing that students who receive supports from AmeriCorps members are accelerating uh, faster than those who aren't. So um, the evidence that we have, I think, is really critical. And then we provide training and support to our members. We're really developing our members to make sure that they can continue on their leadership journey, that there are more Bryans in the world who are um, continuing to make change uh, in their hometown. So um, I think we prioritize evidence. We want to make sure our programs are equitable and that they're accessible and that we're thinking about the workforce pathways that folks might have um, and how we build partnerships with uh, universities, how we build partnerships with employers uh, so that folks can find a path forward. Uh, and then I think the other piece um, is that in AmeriCorps, at, when, when you're applying for a grant with our funds, we're asking you about who you are. We want your community members to define what services are provided to them, right? So we talk a lot about um, proximate leadership. We talk a lot about ensuring the person who is closest to the problem is also in the conversation to determine the solution. And I think um, that's something that we want to see more of, and the way to do that is to make our programs more accessible. So. I hope that answers your question. It, it does, okay, it does. Great. And again, would like to talk a little later about how to get those who aren't involved more involved with AmeriCorps. Paul, you, you touched briefly, but you didn't have time to really go into detail. I'd like to know more about the Navigator Success Plan that, that you've been working with. You know, the benefits, the cost, um, you know, the challenges. Uh, and I think this might be an opportune moment for us to really explore this particular strategy. So can you go into a little more detail about the program? Sure, I'd be happy to, and thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. You know, at Ed Redesign, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're looking for a, a more holistic redesign of our system for not just education, but youth development. So we're always looking for a needle that'll pull a long thread of transformative change, particularly in a moment like this. 
Um, so our concept is simple. Now more than ever, every child needs to be seen, heard, understood, and responded to. This is what children want. This is what families want. This is what educators um, want to be able to do. Uh, children, they, they want to be connected to their peers, to their adults, to, their, to supports, and to opportunities. Our basic design principle in this work is meet children where they are and give them what they need both inside and outside of school in order to be successful and be intentional about doing that. If it sounds familiar, it sounds familiar because it's what those of us who have privilege do for our own children. You know, 24-7, 365 day a year, wraparound services and supports from prenatal all the way to they're in their 20s and 30s as far as I can see. And uh, uh, we need a default system to be able to do that for everyone if you don't happen to be born into the economic and social capital that it takes to get that done. If it sounds familiar, it looks a little bit like a medical system uh, more than our current education system, which is based on an industrial batch processing, one size fits all model, this kind of model uh, prioritizes personalization and, uh, and, and, and customizing an approach that fits the needs of the particular child and speaks to those needs. Uh, we've figured out a little bit how to do it in the education system through our individualized education plan, uh, but we reserve that for children like my daughter who's a special needs child. Um, and why aren't all children special? They're all different, as any of us who have multiple children. So we ought to have a different plan for each one. And we ought to put at the center relationships. We ought to abolish anonymity in, in public education and, and youth work. And uh, so that's the design of the program. The, the basic uh, programmatic features of it are every child deserves a plan. And that plan ought to take some time to develop. You have a navigator who is somebody who uh, is assigned to the student and to the family and stays with that family over a period of time, develops a plan based on that child's assets, on their needs and the kinds of supports and opportunities that they need. And the navigator works as hard as possible to, uh, to make the appropriate connections to get that done. Uh, but that also presumes a system that sits over it, which is where the children's cabinet comes in, that you aggregate up the data from the individualized plans and you begin to see where your cradle to career pipeline has weaknesses, has gaps, and you build those gaps through advocacy and through collaboration. Um, you don't have to do it all at once. You can start where you are. Um, you know, we've just built an institute, stood up an institute for success planning. Tahita Jackson is here uh, with us. We've just brought her on to lead this. So if you meet her, she can talk to you more about this. I think it's a huge opportunity right now, Russell. I think it's, uh, you know, we have a field that's basically exhausted. So you can't talk to them about generic transformative change. People say, wait, I'm having trouble just staffing my classrooms and things of this nature. But you can say, here's something that responds to immediate problems that people are having in welcoming students, for example, back into school, in building relationships, uh, in connecting them with their peers, connecting them to adults, connecting them to the learning process. And, and in so doing, if you can, if you can promote a, um, an, a solution to an immediate problem, and that has a different paradigm than the existing paradigm, you can pull through that transformative change. And there's money on the table, as has been said several times at this conference, to make that happen. So we think this is a particularly opportune moment in which to Now's make the this moment. happen. And, and Ron, to the, to the point that uh, Paul just made about identifying those gaps and filling them in, in my conversation with Barbara about the basics at home, she said, you know, it's, it's a wonderful program. It, it, it's absolutely what we need to be doing. But, and then I got worried, um, she said scaling yes. the work. You know, we need more people in the community and different organizations, the hospital, everyone in this space. So you have backbone organizations represented in the room today. How can we as backbone organizations help to, to carry this message forward and to scale this work. Um, and what would happen if we were to implement this the right way across our communities? Yeah, the, it, it takes backbone staffing. <clears throat> I mentioned we're in roughly 80 communities around the United States. No place is adequately staffed, <laughs> including Boston, where we started with this. But people are still persistent 
and making a lot of progress of it. I have two of my colleagues in the, in the room, Zoe Hansen Debella and Johnson of <laughs> Jocelyn Freelander. Jocelyn's been my partner from the very beginning in developing this. Zoe, in particular, was the backbone lead for the basics in uh, South Coast uh, Massachusetts. And one of the things that she did there, she was really good at pulling together a coalition mm. that worked in that community. And uh, we can, I think maybe we can host another Zoom meeting for this audience where we get a lot more detail uh, on what we actually do. But it basically takes boots on the ground to go around and organize, and it takes time. We started in Boston. Uh, we, it was a leap forward when we hired our, our program director, uh, who has been a social worker in Boston for 25 years, and everybody knows him. So those social networks that you've already got to have around town. But then it's paying your dues. You've got to earn your spot at the table, right? And people, once people know that you want to help them with their agenda, then they're more inclined to help you with your agenda. And we're five or six years in now in Boston, and we're getting to the point now where a Boston-wide collective impact initiative has adopted the basics as its agenda for this year. Okay, so across you know, dozens of organizations, getting families signed up for our text messaging program, for example, is the citywide agenda. The school system mm -hmm. has adopted us mm -hmm. as a partner now. The United Way is helping to lead the other, some, of, some of our stuff, but it takes time. You've got to pay your dues. You've got to get there. But um, it can be done, and we have a, the network, we have a couple we call the Basics Learning Network. We lead, meet monthly leaders across the country. We come, we do the training, we do the collective learning. It's a spiritual <laughs> kind of thing. <Yeah. laughs> um, and I just want to say that, that I mentioned that book we put out in 1999, Urban Problems and Community Development, the epiphany for me in doing that book, because everybody was talking about system change and, system change and sustainability. The question is, what system, sustainability of what, mm -hmm. right? The epiphany was it's not sustainability of any program or arrangement. It's sustainability of the collective commitment. Okay, if you think about why you're here, it's because of your commitment to this issue, to this purpose, right? And so the metaphor is you're trying to build a, sea, a sandcastle next to the seashore, and the waves keep coming and, and washing it away. But if you've got a bunch of people who are committed to have a sandcastle at that location, most of the time you will almost have a sandcastle, right? And that's the, nation, the nature of this work over time. It's continuous. Uh, but anyway, I, I, I think I'm, I'm rambling, rambling a little no, bit, but no, I'd be happy we, to. We may have to set up that Zoom call, so, <laughs> yeah. uh, because there's so much, so much good work going on here. We have about 10 minutes left. What I'd like to do in these last 10 minutes is just give you all an opportunity to share with us ways that we could be more involved with your organization. Uh, not everyone stood up um, when we you know, did the call yeah. for, for AmeriCorps. Um, so how might uh, we connect with you all uh, and, and move this work forward? And we'll just start here and go down the line. Sure, so um, we are a grant-making entity uh, and we have um, a number of notices of funding that will be out in the public um, for you all to consider. I want to say in two months. Um, and it's not just that we put it out and we say good luck. Um, we want to help you. We want to make sure that you have the opportunity to cultivate your ideas. Um, having been on the receiving end of AmeriCorps resources where they said, here's some cash, go plan this and do it in six months, it's really hard to be one person trying to build a backbone or trying to build um, some infrastructure. And so we're really thinking about how do we make sure that we give uh, communities like yours funds to plan and enough funds to plan and time to plan so that um, you can come back, maybe you're not ready to have implementation funds today, but you're, you're ready to start planning because you've been doing that work and you want to see this force multiplier that AmeriCorps can be, then you can take the year and plan and then come back and, and apply for additional funds. So we really want to see, um, we want to see the, we want to see community, we want to see organizations led by leaders in the community, serving their community, doing um, work that is critical to their community, receiving, on the receiving end of our resources. So um, if you have questions, I can't tell you a lot today because it's not public, but I can tell you a lot, hopefully by September, you can also reach out to your um, state commission. So there are 52 state commissions that also um, are partners in our funding process. 
Um, in our case, the key to the front door is our website, which is edredesign.org. And there, what we're doing is we, we highlight our strategies, which are uh, kind of advocacy and field building, uh, secondly, field work, and third, research and tools that we distribute, maps and tools for how to do this work. So you can engage with any of those. We have communities of practice. I just mentioned we have an institute for success planning that we've just set up. We, in these cases, we're not, we're co-constructing this work with people in the field. We honor the work in the field. We're a lab, we're learning from folks doing the work and being pioneers in this. For example, I talked about success planning and I might have mentioned Nashville where we've got 80,000 students who now have an individualized success plan and 6,000 folks acting as navigators in the city of Nashville. So we're shining the spotlight on places like that. We have a, Euro, we have a, um, a rural site in Unity Point, Illinois, where they're also doing success planning in depth. And so if you go to the website, you can find the people in the field who are doing the work with whom you can connect. Uh, and so that, uh, that's the best way to get to us and get connected. We have communities of practice that we're eager to welcome people into and all kinds of tools and, uh, and guidance for people who want to uh, connect with others doing this work in the field. Right. Thank you. Ron. Similarly, we are, we are co-constructing um, a lot of the innovation ideas of crowdsourcing innovation from member, member communities, so it's accumulating. But uh, our website is thebasics.org. If you go there, you can get started today. <laughs> There's a toolkit. Uh, you go upper right-hand corner, you can click on for organizations. There's a toolkit for front-load organizations. There's, uh, if you click on for parents, there's a toolkit for parents with videos and tip sheets. Um, if you, can Zoe and Jocelyn, could you stand up? <laughs> yeah, Zoe is our senior liaison to the Basics Learning Network. Jocelyn is our lead on innovation and um, research. And so uh, you can grab either of them. You can email info at thebasics.com.org, info at thebasics.org, and get back to us uh, about that. And uh, again, I think it would be great to maybe just do a Zoom session mm -hmm. for folks. So we have the Basics Learning Network, and we, uh, we've never, we don't reach out and recruit communities. Communities discover us and, and come in, and we, we build that way. So we welcome, everybody's welcomed. <laughs> And we can just build out from here. And this is a collaborative group. So I am curious, how many of you uh, are implementing the basics in your communities? OK. All right, that's great. So Mika, we'll need to talk. Wonderful. And Barbara, if, if you can uh, wrap us up. But I'd like for you to talk about the leadership development programs that, that you're leading as well uh, at the Annie Casey Foundation. Sure. And this. So it uh, always scares me, the question, because um, demand really exceeds our capacity. Um, but nonetheless, um, but l let me just start by saying, because uh, I think I led with this, that I, there are people in the room here who have taken up this results count approach and are doing it. So you're hearing from Michael McAfee in, in a, a little bit of time. He's a Casey Fellow. Policy Link has adopted this as their way of working. Dreama Gentry is here from Partners for Rural Impact. Jennifer Blatt's from Strive Together. I saw Jeff Edmondson here earlier, who was formerly with Strive Together and now with um, uh, Balmer. Mac Antigua is here from the Obama Foundation. So these are all people who have taken up the practice and in their organizations are doing it. If you're a part of those spheres of influence, we, we would hope that you would um, connect with them. But having said all that, um, we also have a website. Um, and there are some resources on there, but I would really encourage you just to reach out to me directly. I will often say, I'm not sure what we can do, but I will always find resources for you or direct you to people. And, and there are times when we will see a real opportunity to um, work either with an organization or with a system. We have, a, we have had a fabulous partnership with Promise Neighborhoods through the Department of Education and have um, deployed results count to um, all of their um, implementation grantees. That was a huge network that we were able to impact and share this approach with those leaders. So we're always looking for those kinds of opportunities. Um, and so my email address is bsquires at aecf.org and I promise I will get back to you. 
Thank you. We could not do this work without the support of, of our partners and the programs and the services that you've been providing to us is, is making a difference. Now is the moment to, to accelerate this work uh, and we appreciate your leadership. So thank you for being with us today and serving on this panel. Let's give them a round of applause.